Hi guys, this is Jonathan Jensen here at TheEssentialVermeer.com. Here's my take on Vermeer's girl reading a letter at an open window. In September 2021, the girl reading a letter at an open window was exhibited at the Dresden Old Master Picture Gallery after a three-year restoration that altered the picture's appearance dramatically. So much that almost everybody, myself included, had to do some serious rethinking about exactly what is it that makes this painting of Vermeer and maybe what doesn't. Here's a before and after. Before the Dresden exhibition, I'd seen the picture only one time, at a Vermeer exhibition in Madrid, where it disappointed me. The heavy yellow varnish and gaudy Baroque frame made the picture appear unusually dim and shallow compared to the other Vermeer paintings in the same exhibition, especially the women holding a balance which had been recently cleaned. Even though the images of the newly restored painting had been circulating on the web for some time, I didn't know exactly what to expect from the real picture. When I finally stood face to face with it in Dresden, I admit I was stunned. That hushed Rembrandt-esque picture that was visible for hundreds of years no longer existed. The difference between the before and after versions is so striking, Dresden has affectionately dubbed it the new Vermeer. I saw the picture for the second time in the opulent Vermeer retrospective in Amsterdam. The painting literally pops. Sometimes it lurches out from the wall and drags you into the girl's room. Other times it transforms you into an impromptu voyeur spying on the young girl's secrets. The picture is so rich, so complex, and so bathed in sunlight, I could stand in front of it for hours. The impression that really sticks to me, at least for now, is the painting's three-dimensionality, which is barely perceptible in reproductions like the one on your monitor. The light is so brilliant you really wonder if there's a trick. Maybe it's lit from behind or has more light on it than the pictures hung nearby. Now, this may seem a little bit exaggerated, but the painting really strikes me as superior to nature. It's cleaner, more luminous, and more authentic. The atmosphere is youthful and everything possesses a bold thereness that you rarely come across in Dutch genre painting of the time. And it has nothing to do with detail. Gerrit Dow, one of the most highly esteemed and highly paid 17th century Dutch fine painters, itemizes just about every detail you can possibly capture with a brush. But the world he portrays remains a prisoner of the painting and its age. Vermeer's girl instead travels through time without a scratch. It's hard to believe it was painted by a 25-year-old centuries ago. The magnificent young woman, likely Vermeer's wife Katharina, who is one year older than the painter, is painted with exceptional vigor and boundless tenderness, despite the splotchy, almost impressionistic technique. I think you can tell he's in love with her. By comparison, the female faces of top genre artists like Franz Van Mieris look weak and stereotyped. To create such dynamic visual effects, Vermeer plays opposite qualities against one another, relentlessly. Bright versus dark, flat versus round, transparent versus opaque, geometric versus organic, and living versus inert. Saturated colors are set side by side to ethereal grays. Contours alternate between crystalline sharp and subtly blurred. One of the secrets of the painting's energy is that Vermeer accentuates the effects of light and volume by using different kinds of paint in different ways. At times it's crusty thick, other times very thin, semi-lucid, or completely opaque. Sunlit forms are built up with textured paint, called impasto, shadows with smooth, evenly applied paint. The rugged impasto surfaces sparkle and seem to advance towards the viewer's eye, while the thinner ones tend to recede. The alternation of paint textures accentuates volume, creating a dynamic push and pull that cannot be matched by simply variating color and light and shade. There's not a single Dutch genre painter who used paint texturing so audaciously. For example, note how the thickly painted curtain hovers above the evenly painted cupid. You feel you can almost touch the knotty surface of the carpet or snatch the girl's letter with your fingertips. The effect of light is so natural you don't even notice that the right-hand patch on the wall is far too bright, considering it would have received much less light than the opening of the window. To show you exactly what I mean, I copied a patch of the wall to the right and pasted it onto the window opening to the left. It's a bit warmer, but as you can see, it's the same brightness. He pulls the same trick in the lady writing a letter with her maid. 
The patch of the wall to the right of the seated figure is so distant from the window, it couldn't have ever received so much light. If you still have doubts, take a look at a photograph I took in my studio. Notice how the surface of the window to the left is much brighter than the wall a couple meters to the right. So I'm pretty sure Vermeer did not paint this room exactly the way he saw it, but how it was more effective as a picture. Remember, painting is an artifice. It's not telling the truth and nothing but the truth, at least not literally. The profundity of space is really overwhelming. The orthogonals of the geometric perspective system lead the eye into the picture to the foot of the ebony frame. But the strongest depth cues are a series of overlapping objects that force spatial recession in a continual deck of cards progression, beginning with a lime green curtain and ending with the flat background wall. By the way, the barely visible hanging rod and curtain rings to the right tell us the huge green curtain does not belong to the space of the young girl's room. It's a trompe l'oeil device, an imitation of curtains used in Dutch homes to protect precious works of art from dust. The trick was invented by Rembrandt, but exploited to the point of exasperation by Delft church painters whose pictures must have impressed the young Vermeer. One of the most striking examples of this device is a still life with fruit by Franz Vermeeris, who did the curtain, and Adrian van der Spelt, who did the still life. But just in case you think Vermeer was born a supreme genius equipped with everything an artist needs to know, well, the girl reading a letter was his most labored creation of all. Initially, the girl had her back turned to us, perhaps inspired by Jared Tobork's painting of a woman turned away from the viewer with her face reflected in a mirror. X-ray photography tell us that a second Spanish chair, the other one is in the corner behind the still life, was initially set in front of the carpet-covered table. A large Romer drinking glass with grapevines issuing from the top stood upright in the lower right-hand corner of the composition. Various pieces of fruit were added later to the still life. So why isn't everybody ecstatic about the picture after its restoration? Reactions have been mixed. According to a survey on the essential Vermeer, only slightly more than a third of the public is decidedly in favor of the new look. The rest seem to prefer the earlier version or accept it without particular enthusiasm. One despairing critic confided to me we're in front of nothing less than the art crime of the century. Instead, the high-profile international restoration team claims without a moment of hesitation. Yes, this is the way Vermeer wanted us to see the picture. So where's the problem? Why isn't everyone in love with the new Vermeer? Well, there's really three reasons. The Cupid, the composition, and the color. First, obviously, is the somewhat ungainly Cupid. Disbelievers say this pot-bellied infant destroys that intangible mystery and silence that once made this painting a public favorite. The way they see it, it's simply inconceivable Vermeer could have ever wanted the painting to look like that. This witty cartoon by Per Marquand Otzen makes the point pretty well. But is this really the case? Has Cupid really ruined Vermeer's masterpiece? And would he have really wanted to paint it out? Well, I don't have his telephone number, so I really don't know. But I can say this. My devotion to Vermeer is unquestionable. Still, if I had my way, I would have preferred something a bit more relaxing, a bit more neutral. You know, a nice verdant landscape, a comforting biblical scene, or, or even a nameless portrait. Just anything but the Cupid. But who am I to say? Really, if that's the way Vermeer wanted it, then like it or not, that's the way I think we should see it. An X-ray image made in 1979 revealed that the Cupid was already there, hiding under a layer of grape paint on the background wall. It's just that everybody assumed, for one reason or another, Vermeer painted it out at a later stage. Instead, the Restoration Committee demonstrated that it was cancelled by another painter, decades after the painting left Vermeer's studio. Following the multi-year investigation, the picture underwent a thorough cleaning. The old varnish was stripped away and the great paint that concealed the cupid for more than 350 years was removed chip by tiny chip with a surgical scalpel. It took a day's work to remove a single square centimeter. Now, to get a better hold on the Cupid dispute, let's take a quick look at Vermeer's love affair with this peculiar object, because it's not the only time we find it in one of Vermeer's paintings. He appears in three early interior scenes, and a bit strangely, in one of the last, each time in a black ebony frame. Considering that only 35 paintings by Vermeer have survived, 
This means Cupid appears in more than one out of ten paintings. This makes him one of Vermeer's favorite props, even though he dealt in paintings of his colleagues and must have had a wide range of subject matter to choose from. So even if our Cupid is not particularly attractive to 21st century taste, he did mean something very special to Vermeer. The painting itself was likely by the Dutch Caravaggio's Chaser van Everdingen, which in turn was based on an engraving drawn from a Dutch emblem book and shows Cupid standing in much the same way, holding up a card with the Roman numeral 1, recommending only one true love. So, in one way or another, Vermeer's Cupid is letting us in on the fact that the young girl's letter is about love. But as usual, he leaves the contents of the letter up to the viewer's imagination. Vermeer may have also had a slightly more prosaic motivation for using the Cupid so many times. Perhaps it was a nod in deference to his mother-in-law, who very likely owned the Cupid and was very supportive of the artist's career. Cupid makes a rather timid debut in Vermeer's first domestic interior, The Maid Asleep. He's lurking in the upper left-hand corner of the composition. It's so dark that you can hardly make it out unless you're at the New York Metropolitan Museum of Art on a sunny day. Next to that is a mask, which also appears in the Dresden Cupid, but oddly not in the other two versions. The second time the Cupid shows up is in the Dresden piece, where I think he's doing his best to steal the show. The third time, we catch him hovering in the background of the girl interrupted in her music, in the Frick collection. He's almost impossible to make out because the passage, like most of the painting, is in a horrible state of conservation. But he must have played a crucial role before the painting went downhill. Maybe he wasn't that in-your-face infant of the Dresden piece, but he was definitely not the ghost we see today. It may have looked a bit more like this. Cupid exits with a bang in the lady standing at a virginal painted at the end of Vermeer's brief career. I find it a bit curious that even though the Cupid of the Standing Lady is at least as meddlesome as he is in the Dresden piece, he's never provoked any sort of animosity, as he does today in the Dresden picture. The obvious explanation is that we accept his presence simply because that's the way we've always seen the picture, not because it fits in the painting particularly well, which perhaps it really does it, at least from a point of view of modern aesthetics. In any case, he's a star, and he knows it. He absolutely refuses to stay put in the background and has always reminded me of an oversized beach balloon. Now, let's look at the picture's composition, which naysayers believe has been utterly destroyed by the restoration. Compared to the pre-restoration version, the composition of the new Dresden piece looks a bit cluttered. I admit this was my first impression, too. Cupid now fills up the little space that wasn't already occupied by two curtains, a window, a chair, a still life, a Turkish carpet rucked up on a table. But how does it look when we compare it to the pictures he was making at the time? Well, actually, I think it's very much in line. See, for example, the Procuress or the Maid Asleep. Both compositions are filled to the brim, jam-packed like sardine cans. The young painter's penchant for busy compositions didn't dissipate as quickly as you might imagine. A few years later, he painted The Officer and Laughing Girl. Well, it's somewhat less cluttered, but it's still very densely composed. The first time we see an interior scene by Vermeer with an empty tract of space large enough to accommodate something else is in The Milkmaid. However, behind the standing maid, Vermeer had originally included a few porcelain jugs hanging from a wooden rack and the large basket to the right of the figure. So, even at this point, the artist still wasn't completely comfortable with empty spaces. Detractors find the brilliant post-restoration color scheme ruins the picture's former mellow timber. But the colors of Vermeer's early genre pieces are bright and saturated. Reds are red, blues are blue, and yellows are unequivocally yellow-yellow. His gray tints are generally airy, sometimes frosty cool. Now, the palette of the Gresden piece is really the same. The colors of the Maid Asleep are much mellower, but only because it's covered by a thick layer of old varnish, which has the nasty habit of greatly reducing color and contrast. So, in order to facilitate a more informed comparison, I've thrown caution to the wind and attempted a virtual restoration I hope will give us at least an idea of how it might have looked when Vermeer painted it. If you trust the result, I think the kinship with the Dresden piece is a bit more evident. So, what does all this add up to? What am I really trying to get at? 
To me, the Vermeer that emerges from the restored girl reading a letter is a wide-eyed, ambitious painter in his mid-twenties who is bent on making a mark. Such a portrayal is also supported by what we know about his foray into the art market. He began his career, in fact, not as a painter of domestic interiors, but with a series of large-scale so-called history paintings the Diana and her companions, and the Christ in the house of Martha and Mary, and perhaps the St. Praxitis as a warm-up. By aligning himself with the highbrow history mode, his sights were set on the most culturally sophisticated and moneyed art consumer. Once he abandoned the history mode, instead of aspiring to the small ethereal masterpieces of domestic life that we prize so highly today, like the lady riding or the woman with the pearl necklace, he became laser-focused on creating the most powerful illusionistic effects of light, substance, and space, and colorful, knock-down, drag-out compositional arrangements. In a word, paintings that were impossible to walk away from. Of course, that's not to say that the Dresden girl is without subtleties. All you need are a few moments in front of the real picture, and without any help from me, I think you'll discover too many to count. Oh, and let's keep in mind that only such a determined approach would have given the young Vermeer a fighting chance to compete and eventually prosper in the highly competitive and dynamic Dutch art market, otherwise be relegated to obscurity. Well, of course, I'm not a 17th century Dutchman, but I find the new Vermeer is still almost impossible to walk away from. Thanks for listening. Jonathan Jansen here at TheEssentialVermeer.com.